Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Doug Diamond, and I'm a member of the Student Lecture Series Committee here at Cooper Union's Irwin S. Hand School of Architecture. Tonight, we're happy to be joined by Alexander Marigold. Alexander is an assistant professor of architecture at Cornell University and the founding partner at Austin and Marigold in architecture, landscape, and design practice. Alexander's agenda and practice and inquiry focuses on a design and adapt method or a contemporary interpretation of Scolia with the belief that it is preferable to rethink existing resources than to tap new ones, infiltrate existing systems that are responsible for built form rather than reinvent the wheel each time, and repurpose all that is mundane, common, available, and disposable. Together with Jason, Jason Austin, Alexander has received the New York Architecture League Prize for Architects and Designers, the Philadelphia AIA Emergent Architect Prize, and the Urban Edge Prize from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, just to name a few. In 2018, Austin and Marigold's Oculus project won the City of Dreams competition and was built on Governor's Island. The project reimagined old agrarian structures bringing circular metal grain bins from Ohio to New York City, establishing a visual connection between urban and rural modes of living. As always, I'd like to thank Elisa Jaffe and Jeffrey Brown for the continued support of the student lecture series. And without further ado, please join me in welcoming Alexander Marigold. All right, thank you, Dale. Um, okay, let me share the screen. Can you see the? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Great. All right. So, all right. So, first of all, uh, thank you again. I, I must say it's it's a great honor to be invited to. Um, well, first of all, the Cooper Union. Uh, well, actually, maybe first of all, the lecture series. Second of all, the Cooper Union. Uh, first of all, the lecture series, student lecture series, specifically because um, at least in my uh, experience, I think the, the student lecture series are probably the most uh, innovative and in a way the most, uh, let's say, focused on, the focused on the subject that they're trying to uh, explore. I mean, so it's not, you know, without sort of getting too much into the sort of university politics and things like that, uh, big, big league lecture series have a tendency to be, uh, let's say, Let's, let's say it come with some certain strings attached. In this case, I think it's about pure interest and, and excitement about the work. And that makes me really uh, grateful and fascinated to be here. Well, well, I guess to be here in, in however ways we can. So um, I, when I asked to name the talk, I sort of immediately called it an appeal. I, maybe it was sort of the friend of mine, uh, the friend of uh, the frame of mind that I that was in uh maybe but but i i wanted to sort of expand on the title a little bit but before that actually one more thing i noticed that there are a lot of people in the audience whom uh, i know one way or the other so that's great to see familiar faces initials screenshots whatever so and also equally so uh, exciting to see people who have never met before but anyway so unappealing so first of all like i said i'd like to expand on the subject so let's say then appealing materials uh, and the unremarkable forms, types, and objects. Uh, and that seems to, in a way, sort of summarize my, um, at least the last sort of 10 years of work as sort of maybe unappealing as it may sound, uh, but uh, to kind of, I suppose, to, to paraphrase Leo Tolstoy, who used to say that all, all families are sort of happy in a particular way or in the same way, but all uh, unhappy families are very sort of unhappy differently. Uh, so appealing stuff tends to be sort of similar. Unappealing things tend to be unappealing in different ways. Uh, and then there is a very kind of, um, let's say, uh, a fine line between, uh, and that's why this un is kind of a separate thing, uh, what makes the appealable unappealable and vice versa. So I guess I'm, what I'm trying to do is work on the kind of, on this cusp and try to take things that may be unappealing at the moment or from a particular perspective and maybe make them uh, somehow usable, usable, useful, um, appealing, and sort of so on. And since so the same goes for unremarkable, it's, it's not about, um, it's not about mm, sort of immediate fascination. So it's, I guess it's, it's the long, long game. So uh, there are a couple of images that I wanted to show as kind of a, as an examples, and they 
they, the kind of a long archive and, and that archive comes from this point all over the globe. This one happens to be in Iceland. Uh, the, the smell of this drying fish was extremely unappealing, but the, um, um, the, the sound that it produced was quite amazing. And so is the, uh, the lighting. Uh, this huge blade coming on the trailer somewhere in central Pennsylvania is, you know, just like a huge, enormous piece of infrastructure, uh, almost pushed me off the road at some point. But at the same time, there's something about this mass, uh, it's sort of pure form and also it's kind of out of context, out of context presence as, as a piece of sculpture that seemed really potentially fascinating. Uh, this is a typical shed. This happens to be in Ithaca, but there are thousands of those things everywhere else. Uh, just because the light hit it a particular way, there's something that could be productive. Um, this is um, like kind of a post-industrial little town, uh, one lake over from us. There's something about the color, I think, here that is, um, that may, oh, and also the way the sun hits it. So maybe this is kind of a, a sort of an Italian scenario because it's all about the shadow. But there's something uh, about this image that, you know, made me think about sort of color and, 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 and material and composition. So I sort of filed it away for future use. Uh, well, these things, these things are interesting in a way because, again, they're typical, you know, agrarian sheds made out of essentially like plastic bags and they puff up when they warm up and they kind of exhale when, uh, when they cool down. Again, when the sun hits them, they become transparent. So these things have a life of their own, as unappealing as they may be. Uh, this thing, I mean, they kind of have similar purposes, I suppose, to both towers. I mean, one is a water tower on the right, the other one is a train. Uh, they're about, I think, four centuries apart. The one on the right is in Ithaca, the one on the left is in Copenhagen. But they're both industrial structures. They're not particularly uh, sort of fascinating. I'm not sure if anybody even kind of designed them from a kind of pure uh, formal standpoint. Uh, they're fairly sort of typical structures of their time, but at the same time, they're quite uh, remarkable, I think. And uh, fortunately, the one on the right already disappeared. Um, this is sort of pure formal stuff. I mean, some crates and, you know, are, uh, a chunky, chunky, chunky stair that somehow is, again, has a sort of a potential and possibility. Uh, again, two different kinds of sheds, one with a hole, one with a kind of its own sort of microcosm on the inside. Again, I think something sort of really sort of fascinatingly interesting about uh, sort of these are again. This is about colors and about remnants. The one on the on the left is Iceland. The one on the right is just outside my garage. Happen to be some sort of pieces floating around. Uh, this one is a kind of the, the the beginning of an application of of of, of that and appealing. The one on the right is the Arizona Cardinal Stadium bathroom because all there was. It was just a bunch of stalls because all people do in stadiums is drink beer and watch football and then eat afterwards. So, but at the same time, you know, if 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 there is a sort of an application of color to this thing, something happens to them, especially when the doors are open. The same thing, the, similarly, as uh, let's say a, a simple bus uh, bus shed, just a you know glass little thing, uh, can become essentially a golden dome or a golden house. If the sun hits it just so. Uh, this thing, I don't even know, it's just an abandoned house. The corners are amazing. The corners are just kind of wrap around themselves with a, uh, with a cool sort of silver, silver foil material. Uh, decay. Decay is unappealing, but at the same time, you know, this kind of pure mass of steel sitting on pure mass of concrete. There's something really kind of exciting about it. Um, and this is uh, kind of a landscape, landscape and some uh, sort of striping on the ground, right? So it's a little landscaping and, and lines. Uh, and then this kind of relentlessness. Uh, this is a kind of a never ending, I guess, cow barn that just becomes at some point um, I know, somewhere between landscape and architecture. Uh, but then there's also this kind of unappealing, and we'll talk about it a little further. Uh, that makes me sort of wonder if anything can be done about uh, either demolition that sort of goes straight into the landfill or the stuff that we produce on the right, which is uh, vinyl siding, that is, um, let's say, let's, let's say supports the, 
the idea by its very existence of going into the landfill. Um, and basically, this kind of stuff, right? So this is where the this is this is not really an appeal. This is sort of disgusting, right? This is uh, your kind of typical uh, American, but sort of more so global situation where a certain type of building just essentially disappears, uh, goes straight into the landfill after a fairly short uh, period of existence, and sort of nobody thinks twice about it. So this is where, as a practice, we began to try to make some kind of a difference first by trying to salvage some of the um, uh, construction debris, like uh, this uh, XPS foam, and try to make things out of it. So this, this thing is called plant, which is like a plant or bank. So we did a whole series of uh, essentially outdoor furniture of this stuff. It's virtually indestructible. Um, but also I started looking into the past and trying to see sort of similar examples where this kind of unappealing stuff can, can essentially cross the threshold uh, into a possibility, right? So this is where like something like Casa de Crescenzi became really important to me. Uh, the idea of uh, disused uh, vestiges of previous civilizations becoming something else uh, or the um, uh, amphitheater in Arl, which basically formally didn't change for a while, but became, you know, when I started as, a, started as a sports facility, ended up being a city and now a monument. Uh, or like, you know, fairly sort of strange things like this. This is in the, in the Princeton Museum, uh, essentially a portrait made out of capital, of a in column capital, so it's kind of straight up recycling. Uh, or something like this, which I discovered in the Rodin Museum. Uh, apparently, he was the sculptor at Rodin. He had a, a vast collection of uh, these sort of ancient Roman and Egyptian objects that he used as starting points for his sculptures. Again, kind of unremarkable, but at the same time, there's a raw power in, in these little early things that I think translates into his later work. Um, or this thing, you know, it's a kind of very unappealing memorial to uh, a Russian emperor that became a kind of anti-memorial, sort of ate itself up after right after the revolution when it was essentially kind of reprogrammed as a as a monument to the um, to the overthrowing of the emperor. Um, or things like that. This is you know fairly recent stuff. Um, you know, the the thing on the left is uh, a taxi uh, sign made out of uh, oil can in Cuba. Uh, the thing on the right is a bunch of uh, eyewear made out of essentially things you find on the street. Uh, this was a kind of fascinating moment in 2003 when, you know, fairly immediately the stuff that we saw on TV, uh, this kind of strange, kitschy, you know, AK-47 gold plate that, that was found in Saddam's palaces became a really, really expensive lamp uh, for, uh, made by Floss by Philippe Sturt. Um, this is a uh, Jugat canopy, again, uh, and appealing in the sense that <clears throat> it's made out of like this kind of everyday stuff, but <clears throat> really fascinating because then when the stuff is multiplied, it's becoming something else. And in this case, <clears throat> it's essentially a public, um, a public installation by Sanjeev Sharkar. Uh, the exact opposite of this price-wise and sort of intention-wise is the, the work by Drogue. Uh, in the 90s, but sort of again, similar idea that kind of the unappealing becomes actually remarkable, remarkably expensive with that. Uh, the work of uh, Alexander Brodsky, I'm a big fan of. Again, it's the kind of everyday mundane stuff that you would never think twice, uh, not particularly exciting in principle, becomes reformulated as a, this little gem. Or this is actually a fairly local thing. I still don't know who the architect is, but there's got to be an architect. Uh, it's in Bordet, New York, which is somewhere between here and uh, Seneca Lake. Uh, it's, a, it's a public library made out of, of the debris of a building that I guess was found on site. So just as a kind of quick background, I'm, I'm sort of somewhere in between. So on the right is Tashkent, Uzbekistan. It's kind of half colonial, half, uh, let's say, indigenous oriental or indigenous Central Asian city. Uh, and then we started working, Jason and I, in Central Pennsylvania, because that's where we got our first job. Uh, and we started with uh, sort of in this intersection of landscape and, and architecture, because Jason you know, is a landscape architect 
And I think that so, you know, projects like this where the, the idea of a artist residency in, in Andes, New York, essentially got tied into a kind of a production of art, like essentially a kitchen that was surrounding the building and was providing insulation. Uh, equally so, became fascinated with sort of signs and symbols. And again, this kind of everyday stuff, like, I mean, this is the, the coat of arms of the city of New York. But somehow you don't think twice about it. You see it everywhere, but um, we ended up sort of relying heavily on this uh, symbology and this grand uh, resource project, which is re-envisioning the grand concourse in the Bronx. Uh, here is the prototype for this thing in an exhibition uh, for the Architecture League. Again, a sort of a similar form based on uh, a very typical, until fairly recently, uh, tower in Philadelphia that had to do with uh, drawing of the, uh, the fire hoses as a proposal for uh, public art piece at the fire station number 38. Uh, this is a storefront for Artimity, which we had we asked we were asked to deal with, you know, like they're a lighting company, so we have to do with light. So the idea was to essentially, you know, make light visible, and you know, we played with these helium uh, balloons for a while until we figured out how they move and how they uh, deflate over time. So over whatever three weeks of the existence of the installation. It changed every day because the balloon would sort of deflate and inflate and come up, come up and come down. Um, this was a project that dealt with this idea of uh, essentially revitalizing this kind of South Brooklyn and Red Hook area in the Gavanas Canal. And the, the idea was, and if, you know, those of you have probably been there, well, of course, you, well, many of you are in New York right now anyway. Uh, there are essentially what, two bridges there, even though there are about 14 streets that actually potentially can cross it. And the idea is that each neighborhood can basically essentially develop and design their own bridge. Uh, and then finally, we started building things still uh, essentially out of remnants of our own project. So this is one of the first projects we ever did. This is a mini golf course in Governors Island in 2008, essentially a, a series of leftover roofing schemes. Uh, the idea was that it would be waterproof, but the idea also that it had to do with uh, the kind of initial uh, golfing development in Manhattan in the early 1900s, apparently, golfing on the roof on roofs was very popular uh, pastime. I don't know where these balls landed, but apparently that was a thing. Um, anyway, sort of kind of a similar idea of essentially a backyard that's uh, uh, developed on, 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 on this sort of Exaggerated geometry. This is a proposal for uh, Jardin de Métis in Quebec. Uh, there's a fascination with horizon. So there's kind of a landscaping uh, component to this thing. That is a project that came out of a residence in uh, Northern Ireland, Northern Iceland, uh, with the idea being that we showed up there with a kind of set proposal, but then we realized that it's completely useless because the place itself had its own sort of strange and undiscoverable, uh, let's say, presence. So we initially basically threw everything out and started documenting the place. So this is one of the ways of documenting it. This is another. So this is like over the course of 24 hours, sort of changing of the horizon. Uh, and then essentially had to map the whole thing with the GPS. And this is when the process of that we discovered these dotted lines, which were essentially ditches. And then the ditch became a site for a project made out of you know, completely unappealing, sort of found, uh, I don't even know what, discarded sort of crap, let's call it this, let's, let's call it spade spade, that framed a horizon in a particular way and uh, sort of told us kind of an Icelandic saga that had to do with this island that you see far, far away. Anyway, so at some point, uh, we also realized that there's a kind of, um, um, let's say, um, representation component to this thing. And this is the project, the project is called Four Books and it has to do with uh, at least my personal, um, let's say, discovery of Palladio. Um, and you probably, and if you see me, you see that there's behind me, there's a portrait there, which came from this exhibit exactly. 
Uh, the idea being that, uh, I mean, I didn't really think twice about Palladia until, you know, like this project came about and until we started working in central Pennsylvania. And then I realized that Palladia was actually a similar, had to deal with similar sort of unappealing situations, at least in his life, meaning that he worked for people who were essentially agrarian uh, sort of gentleman farmers who was dealing with like barns and, you know, uh, villas and sort of these kind of productive landscapes, let's say, these agrarian productive landscapes. Uh, and then he ended up sort of dressing them in these, in these like really kind of bizarre, uh, but these are fascinating, but at the same time kind of forgotten uh, Roman accoutrements. Uh, and then produced a, a series of uh, woodcuts, which is a very kind of, let's say restrictive medium. So anyway, so we tried to do sort of a similar thing. Like once we've discovered Palladio, we said like, okay, well, why not try to kind of make our own version of four books where instead of Palladio's, uh, I mean, this was all, by the way, uh, this was all done for the, the 500th birthday of Andrea. Uh, so, but rather instead of celebrating him, we decided to kind of celebrate ourselves, which was sort of strange, but at the same time, you know, we were young and somewhat full of ourselves. But anyway, so we started making these uh, sort of four books of architecture and, and, and woodcut prints. Uh, and this medium, uh, as sort of strange as it is, I think is, was very productive in terms of um, uh, let's say kind of you have you have to you have to be really kind of precise what you're trying to draw when you only have black and white and very very limited language essentially put it this way. Uh, so you know there are 25 um, prints that came out of this and it became an exhibition. Uh, here's an example of this thing. Here's Palladio himself holding the projector. Uh, here's another version of the thing. I'm about to ship it out to uh, Athens to the National Museum tomorrow, hopefully. So this thing kind of continues. So the idea of, of this kind of representation became very important uh, in our in our work. Uh, as also this kind of refiguring of uh, rural and urban paradigm, which we realized was a very 20th century thing. But at the same time, now it seems like, you know, cities really want to grow things, whereas suburbs really want to be urban. So instead, uh, it seems like there's a kind of gradient. So that's where we, we you know, paraphrasing cool house, I suppose, started coining our own terms, so we're all in urban, and started trying to kind of represent, uh, you know, kind of as a representational project, uh, trying to kind of understand how one got there. So this is a kind of uh, the age of reason and colonial extraction. This is sort of present day. So there's a whole series of these things that in very kind of, again, restricted ways, and the idea was that it would be woodcuts too, uh, kind of documented this uh, sort of set of human habitations, uh, including also some of the data that, that uh, dealt with um, kind of the formation of the soil conditions, we call it the average building lot size, natural gas prices, and so on. Uh, also various modes of transport and uh, development of codes. Uh, as as well as kind of visual understanding of what a thousand people per square mile would look like. Um, anyway, so and this is so all this is happening in this kind of this corridor, uh, central PA, nor, uh, central New York, nor, nor, northern Pennsylvania. Uh, there's also sort of this kind of paradigm. So this is the Andrew Wife uh, painting. Christina's world was very somehow instrumental to our development. Uh, and also, there's this kind of Dile well, it's not so much dilemma, this condition that we discovered. So this is uh, uh, Benjamin Henry Latrobe complaining to Robert Mills about this kind of situation that, you know, the architect is forever stuck between the kind of gentlemanly side of the profession and the building mechanic version of it, uh, which is true to this day. So we decided that rather than mm, trying to kind of succumb to this situation, uh, we try to be different kind of people. Uh, and this was the premise, right? The, the idea of slow architecture, that the idea that the repurposing of the existing stuff rather than tapping new things was, was important. And the idea also that we would be able to understand this, how the systems work and we would be able to uh, also maybe make some of these things ourselves. So that led to like the initial set of projects uh, where like uh, we, had, we had another partner involved in this thing, uh, Vlad Paikic. So this is a kind of uh, redevelopment of an existing uh, building. Uh, it's a, essentially a golf clubhouse. 
uh, not quite go from my life, but this is what we dealt with this sort of condition. Uh, and it's all had to do with these sort of found objects and found uh, sort of conditions there. And by the way, the photographs were taken by Nicole Bouchard, which are really amazing. I highly recommend her as a photographer and uh, amongst other things. Anyway, um, uh, but we kind of tried to do sort of holistic, you know, wor work of architecture, uh, in designing everything, including painting our own murals, uh, like even sort of framing some some things, like fabricating stuff. Um, you know, as much as one can within that uh, sort of sural condition. And landscape was very much part of it as well, as were all these kind of very common, mundane, unappealing materials. And let's call it unremarkable building typology. This is a pump house. And this is what it is. Uh, no, we're essentially surrounded by things like that there. Uh, and eventually, and this is kind of maybe the latest sort of paradigm. I started to sort of think about the idea of uh, form. That form doesn't necessarily have to change, right? And that had to do with this uh, amplitude the gnarl that you know form can persist. Uh, the idea that material doesn't necessarily have to be um, like sort of base material doesn't have to be uncool material. Like all materials have a chance to uh, exist if especially if they're already there, especially if they're produced, um, and maybe transcend their banality and transcend, transcend their baseness. Uh, and the same with typology. Typology is a kind of um, sort of, let's say, fleeting thing. Um, it's very difficult to, at least for me, to talk about, about what, 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 is, what typologically one thing is and one typologically isn't. It's sort of a little bit like uh, you, you know when you see it type situation. Uh, but so can, can this kind of typological relationships be very kind of gingerly tweaked? And some of the projects that I'll show you, I think, are trying to do that. And also technology and technique. The question is, can it absolute, obsolete technology, uh, instead of becoming essentially a doorknob uh, or sort of doorstop, can it be used for something else? So, so there's that. And then finally, fairly recently, I kind of came across uh, so this is uh, Stalker, the movie, uh, but I came across the book that um, uh, sort of started it. And it's called The Roadside Picnic, and I highly recommend it. It's a, it's a kind of a sort of strange fiction from 1971, uh, but here, here's a quote, right? So in this conversation to people, you know, you're absolutely right, our little town as a whole, which very much resonates with, with Ithaca. Uh, it always has been and still is, but now it's a hole into the future. I mean, you can also equally sort of reverse that and say hole into the past. Uh, we're going to dump so much through this hole into our lousy world that everything will change in it. Life will be different. It will be fair. Every, everyone will have everything that he needs. Oh, she was close. Uh, some hole, huh? Knowledge comes through this hole. And when we have the knowledge, we'll make everyone rich and we'll fly to the stars and go anywhere we want. And that's the kind of hole we have here, uh, especially after the pandemic. Uh, I think this kind of uh, sort of interchangeability of future and the past became very uh, seminal, let's say. So, and I guess finally, we also try to, not always, but as much as we can kind of operate uh, on the kind of, um, I suppose not even typology, but kind of a logo, uh, sort of like if a project can be reduced to like this kind of a small uh, thumbprint, maybe there's something to be said about it. So I'm going to talk about three types. And basically, I think all our projects are about three types. Uh, this kind of um, sort of grain silo, where you can kind of uh, like an enclosed object, uh, a shed and a barn. Uh, the programs tend to be more or less always the same too, which is sort of strange, as, although I suppose I have a colleague at Cornell who says that everything you do is always a monastery. I mean, everything one does, which I suppose one can argue, but I don't know. But I, I can argue that I think everything we do so far somehow has to do with monumentality, exhibition, and shelter. Uh, and I'm going to talk, I'm going to talk about specifically three projects, uh, solar crossing the line and oculi, but in the process, I'm going to touch on some others as well. They're sort of going to be almost like footnotes. So Sural Arc came uh, immediately after the big flood in New York. Uh, and this was a project in Socrates Sculpture Park. 
uh, and Socrates sculpture, sculpture Park was underground completely, uh, underwater rather, sorry, uh, during Katrina. So, uh, Sandy rather, sorry, not Katrina. Uh, so when we, you know, when we propose an installation there, somehow the idea of kind of this low ground and the idea of um, folly came from the notion of dark because, you know, nobody really knows what happened to it. I mean, I guess if you look at the Armenian coat of arms, it's it's on top of Mount Ararat, but it's just sitting there. And I kind of thought that, okay, well, maybe that arc is essentially was 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 the first folly. Once it served its purpose, it's sort of no longer a boat, but it's also no longer a house. It's sort of somewhere in between. So the idea that uh, somehow the arc can become um, essentially the sort of reference back to its boatness and its houseness. Uh, was an, an interesting sort of moment, especially when we started sort of remembering, you know, these uh, houseboats or turned house or reused boats and um, the coast of England somewhere. So the first doodles were essentially reflecting that. But also um, we started thinking back to our first projects when we formed uh, Austin and Marigold. Uh, we had this um, um, really kind of, again, unappealing to say the least project that had to do with uh, essentially low income housing. Uh, and we worked with a particularly sort of interesting developer who basically said, okay, you know, like all these things that you guys are trying to innovate are amazing, but I won't be able to sell a single unit. So therefore we're gonna have to do what, you know, what people buy. And that's sort of stuff like this, even though within that there are like a whole bunch of interesting things happening. It sort of looks like it looks. Um, so this was the kind of first frustrations, but also first discoveries of things like vinyl siding and the idea that this stuff as sort of odious as it is, can also uh, be used for non-planar uh, things, which is kind of interesting. Uh, it also turned out that the thing takes light beautifully, especially some of these uh, shades, which is kind of interesting. I think the, the, the yellow is the most translucent. Uh, and also this kind of idea of the A-frame is very much fascinating for us too. So this is one of the really early projects that kind of a proposal for uh, a bridge that uh, houses a whole bunch of birds. It's near bird sanctuary. It's essentially the idea is it's a kind of dilapidated barn that birds already occupied. Uh, and it's essentially it's kind of off the shelf process and you know uh, polycarbonate polycarbonate that, that holds hold all this stuff together. Uh, so anyway, so the Sural Arc became this kind of strange amalgam of um, these kind of lofty thoughts about uh, Noah's Ark. Uh, but also, you know, our experience in Central Pennsylvanians and, and vinyl siding and things like that. I also kind of, I suppose, uh, has some formal uh, debt to uh, Peter Zumthor. But in this case, I mean, it's purely driven by the, um, we're trying to basically push the geometry of vinyl siding as far as, far as we can, but somehow we ended up with this uh, very Zumthor-esque sort of situation. Uh, so here it is. Well, of course, we also had to, in the process, we realized we had to install this thing upside down. Uh, for the ease of installation. So it was a very leaky arc, uh, but at the same time kind of suggests the idea that it could always be flipped back and become a boat. So here it is. Uh, again, it's a kind of sort of, it's a monument, it's a shelter. I mean, some people actually used it at some point as a wedding hoopla. Uh, it's a kind of sort of strange in between uh, condition, but pretty fascinating on the inside, especially when the light hit it, but ultimately dramatically made out of completely unappealing things. There is Jason, by the way, on the left, in case you're wondering. Um, so, but, you know, these kind of things, uh, so this was 2014, and then some years later, so uh, about two years ago, we were asked to design a climbing gym here uh, in Lansing. And, um, Basically, this kind of A-frame became kind of an important thing again, because it seemed like actually an appropriate uh, geometry and also again, in terms of budgetary sort of reasons, uh, it was a good idea. So this kind of idea that somehow an A-frame can sponsor a climbing condition and a different truss geometry can also kind of help uh, with, the, with the climbing surfaces. So it essentially came to a really uh, like sort of simple solution where this, a simple gambrel truss, truss was facing out on one side and facing in on the other side and then essentially created all the variations. So we developed this thing pretty far, but then, you know, various pandemics and all these other things happened. So maybe one day we'll build it, but it's not there yet. 
But the point is, you can see that essentially uh, the, the thing in red, it's in addition to a whole bunch of like very banal uh, sheds that already exist. One contains a soccer stadium, another one contains a skating rink. So it's sort of stuff like this. But stuff like this, I also kind of find as an appealing as it is pretty fascinating. Uh, and it goes back to the project that we did some years before that. And uh, we were asked to do a tennis court. And the idea was rather than trying to kind of reinvent the bicycle on how to do a tennis court in the kind of rural central New York, we essentially bought a cow barn uh, off the shelf and refitted it as such. Uh, it had to be attached to, to a guest house in order for uh, the permit to be granted because otherwise it would be just a sporting facility. But essentially it was, it was a guest house with an attached tennis court, even though tennis court is you know, 10 times as large. But anyway, so, so here's the, the, the kind of uh, the, this retrofit situation. So, but you can imagine, you know, like in, in this condition on the left before uh, all the sort of fancy stuff came in, I mean, you could see sort of cows or tractors or all sorts of other things hanging out there just as, just as well. So sort of typologically completely mute. And this is the residence, uh, which we kind of had to, in a way, redesign at some point because at some point, uh, instead of two story, it became one story and all had all this extra steel. And this extra steel became, and if you see my cursor, sort of these things and sort of furniture and, and actually even the screen on the side. Anyway, but the point is this thing being a barn and this thing being a barn, they kind of cousins, even though they're fairly different. Uh, and also uh, this is a really recent project, this is big small house as we call it on Owasco Lake. It's essentially a barn as well. Uh, it's actually two barns because the idea is that um, it was rather the family that commissioned that uh, was just two people, but they also had the huge extended family. So there's essentially the two houses, one big one and one small one. So we said, okay, let's split them in half and then you're going to have your big barn on top and then your small barn on the bottom and you can completely separate the two uh, in the winter time. But it's, it's essentially made out of, you know, like your typical sort of barn material. And um, uh, the fascinating thing there for me, at least, was a kind of rediscovery of, of, of a detail or the ability to use a detail that I discovered in Reykjavik at some point, the idea of just kind of rolling a corner with the corrugated siding, because otherwise uh, you end up with a really kind of nasty bulky details. It took a while to convince the contractor to actually try it. And once he tried it, it's like, oh, well, well why aren't we doing that? Uh, Anyway, so here it is, right? So this is a kind of direct translation between sort of this thing, which uh, in Reykjavik has a slower of being, uh, not, not only then have too much trees in there to begin with, but apparently this corrugated metal came as ballast at some point from England. So they started using it unbeknownst to them. Anyway, the point is that here it is in central New York, this kind of Icelandic detail uh, found the perfect home. Um, crossing the line is a project that is not really formal, but it has to do with a kind of local difficult history. Let's it's, it's put it this way. Uh, so Ithaca is a post-glacial uh, condition, as you know, probably some of you have heard, Ithaca is gorgeous. Uh, it's also post-agrarian, it's sort of slowly, I mean, the big farms are, are, are taking over the small farms, so it's a, it's a kind of post-agrarian in a certain sense. Uh, it's also post-industrial, weirdly enough, we have actually a fairly, um, um, sort of a long history of making things like transmission chains here. Uh, but it's also very much post-colonial and that's something that somehow is not particularly sort of, let's say, well-known or well-advertised, not at least not, not until recently and not to uh, kind of the Cornell community. Uh, oops. And also I would say even kind of post-historic, this kind of idea of the past uh, as it's something that's really sort of un unpleasant and complicated has been sort of hidden by the sort of strange things like, oh, you know, everything in, in, in central New York has these kind of strange Latin and, and, and Roman and sort of classic English names. Uh, and this guy on the left is Simeon DeWitt, the surveyor, who is uh, sort of responsible for all this stuff. So there's this map called the, the um, well, Simeon DeWitt, DeWitt map of central New York. It's actually called the military track map. It's essentially uh, a form of payment for a uh, revolutionary war to, to the to Washington's army. So essentially, you know, like about 2 million acres of land were taken over and surveyed in this manner. 
uh, 27 square townships um, with this um, with these um, little sort of tiny square lots that were given away after the, after the fact were chopped up uh, because there was just no 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 money was available to pay but the land was made available let's put it this way it was made available through uh, well of course and then it was sort of named these sort of strange things like Ulysses lot and, and so on and so forth Pompeii uh, this kind of exper experimentation and land, um, let's say, gridding, started in central New York and then 25 years later was repeated in, in Manhattan. Was the same Simeon DeVitt was one of the commissioners. Uh, so I guess they tried it first in, in, in central New York and then uh, since it worked, they kind of tried it again in Manhattan and worked really well there. But before that map, uh, the, the central New York map was available. There was this map, this map and this is the map of um, General Sullivan's campaign, which again is not particularly well known, at least not to Cornell community, uh, not to kind of, you know, the, the sort of the students who, who, who attended or even the faculty. And the idea was that General Washington, and you see this on the left before he was president, uh, sent Major General Sullivan to uh, essentially commence this kind of war of attrition uh, and seizure of uh, uh, the the Native American land, and the the order to destroy and kill is fairly you know open. There is no kind of middle ground about it. So basically, between the quote on the left and the quote on the right, which is kind of presentation of this uh, enclosed map by Simeon Dewitt, there's about 25 years of uh, I guess we can call it, well, well, seizure, dispossession, genocide. You know, you you, you can call it this. You can kind of go as far as as far as you want. Uh, but the point is, uh, this was this is the kind of very very colonial experience at the very uh, sort of center of foundation of the United States, which happened right here. And very few people kind of know about it. But for example, the Solomon's March is actually very much uh, documented still. Uh, in these markers around town, well, not around not town. This is Lodi, so it's sort of near here. Uh, there's even um, there was even published um, a kind of a diary, a set of diaries of the people who took part in this campaign, and they were actually really kind of strangely fascinating to read this stuff. Because on the one hand, like okay, we killed that many Iroquois Indians today, uh, and on the other hand, the land is so beautiful; it's going to be the kind of the the, the gem of the uh, of the new United States. This kind of foundation of this country on the sort of blood and um, essentially dispossession of, of the indigenous people is very much apparent here. So once, you know, then the, the idea was to uh, kind of make some kind of a public installation about this map. I was really fascinated by this map. And once I started sort of discovering these issues there, uh, I realized that it has to do something with this kind of uh, colonial existence in the last 100 years. So we went and then we tried to find traces of this existence. So these are essentially we went through all these kind of junkyards and local antique towns, antique uh, stores, and tried to find um, anything, any pieces of wood that were worked by hand that were like you know, 200, 100 years old. So we kind of collected a whole bunch of this junk. And then we went in search of um, essentially presence of this map on the land. Uh, and it turned out that essentially Cornell campus is located more or less in this, in this quadrant and this, um, so this is the central quad right here. So this this line, which is essentially drawn with like, um, let's say, pen and ink. Uh, and the map is about, by the way, this big. It's about like 30 inches wide. Um, so this this uh, this line can actually be somehow translated and understood. So and this is where it runs, so it kind of located the site. And I uh, made an agreement with the, with the, um, uh, the with the essentially people who, who cut the grass, uh, not to cut this kind of ink blotch that we sort of blew up. Uh, so essentially it will kind of become hopefully a native meadow, which of course didn't work out that well just to kind of running ahead because it was um, it was a major, major drought that year. Like, yeah. uh, but then also the idea was that crossing this line uh, on axis with the, the, the famous McGraw Tower and the War Memorial would be uh, essentially a level. Uh, the level that indicated this kind of idea of a flat piece of paper on which this line was drawn in relationship to the ground, which was not flat at all. The, the idea that somebody could sit and, and 
in their office and kind of project this grid onto uh, not only a landscape that they didn't know, but also on the kind of local lives and livelihoods that they didn't care about. It was really kind of fascinating. So we sort of crawled on our sort of two feet with a whole bunch of students trying to uh, kind of map this thing with a whole bunch of flags. I mean, so this in itself was a kind of interesting exercise. So it's almost a surveying exercise. Uh, so this is the kind of section through this thing. So showing a fairly dramatic difference over 150 feet. So this is what it looks like, uh, looked like rather, uh, temporary. Uh, like I said, it's an axis with the tower and the, um, the flagpole. Uh, and then these two quotes that I showed earlier were essentially engraved into this uh, frieze made out of this sort of colonial, uh, let's say, spolia, let's call it that. Um, and uh, it was kept with this ridge, essentially, of uh, aluminum, this kind of shiny thing, which it sort of made this thing somewhere between a kind of a commemorative Roman arch and the surveying instrument. And um, um, I gotta say, this was kind of an interesting project because like, first of all, for me, it was um, like a kind of a really fascinating dive into a very kind of unappealing, let's say actually unsavory American history, which I had no idea about. Well, I mean, not that, I mean, obviously, you know, like basically you can read Fanny Moore Cooper, but that's about, you know, that's about as far as one can go. But the idea that the lands that we, the very university exists on were dispossessed uh, was not advertised by any means. But strangely, this project actually kind of was caught between uh, the university's obvious resistance to sort of discuss these issues and deal with them uh, and the Native American community essentially struggling to get the recognition that they deserve uh, of this kind of genocidal takeover. Uh, but they thought it was their fight. So in a way, um, the project was caught between kind of different understandings of history, but ultimately after a lot of very difficult discussions, which again, I didn't anticipate, uh, the university president essentially proclaimed that uh, the university stands in Fugue territory. So something that, you know, was I think some 30 years in the making happened because of this. And, you know, as, a, as, a, as neither Native American nor kind of, um, uh, let's say, descendant of the first settlers, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a refugee from, from, um, from Tashkent, Uzbekistan. I feel actually kind of proud, I suppose, or at least, I don't know, um, happy to contribute it to kind of pushing this thing over into at least some kind of discussion, because before that, there was no discussion whatsoever. All right, and finally, um, let's talk about Aculi. And so Dove mentioned that, so Aculi came from this idea that the only successful um, building designed for disassembly that I know in the United States is a grain bin, which was designed about 100 years ago, patented in 1916, so here it is. Uh, and also on the left is a Unistrad system, which we've used before, but it's 1926 patent. Uh, also, like by the very nature, designed for disassembly. So these two things somehow became a kind of catalyst. But even before that, this idea of uh, kind of Bucky Fuller sort of the Maxim House and an homage, and maybe even kind of a continuation of the work uh, was very much with us. So we designed this house in the can, and then it and, and we sort of had all sorts of fun with it. You can get a six pack, you can get all sorts of things out of that. Uh, and a lot of people are actually kind of interested in this idea, but somehow until we were able to kind of work out all the kinks, we needed some kind of uh, sort of proof of concept. And the proof of concept came in the form uh, of this project that happened to be again on Governor's Island. We sort of go back there. Uh, the City of Dreams uh, competition essentially entered this idea that we would uh, find an existing grain bin and convert it into, seamlessly convert it, disassemble it and reassemble it into this uh, sort of structure uh, in order to uh, not only deal with uh, kind of the, the idea that, you know, you kind of connect this sort of rural and, and urban areas, but also, again, prove the idea that you can take disparate systems that are well-designed and make something else out of them. It's kind of a, a sort of a version of spoiling, I suppose. Um, so these are some of the kind of initial projects and we started making models out of uh, soup cans and I asked students to eat a lot of soup uh, and out of various toilet rolls. 
and uh, I started collaborating with engineers and then the local artist uh, and then started making prototypes. Once we bought two silos, here they are from Ohio. They're actually weirdly 40 years old. They look like new, but they're actually quite beat up. They used to hold corn. Uh, they came on the flat on the flat bed and they were tiny, but even though each one was 30 feet tall. So this is the first installation. And the idea is essentially kind of became sort of almost like those instruments in Jaipur, right? That you could see the sun track on the ground. You could just sort of sit there and watch the thing, uh, sort of catch the sun differently. Uh, there's also uh, this idea, which is which came from from the collaborating artists, that uh, the the colors were to be essentially matching to the sky. So at some point you could like look up, uh, lift up your head into one of the oculi, and maybe it would maybe disappear, which sometimes happens, not always. Um, Anyway, and then of course, uh, it's it was all off the shelf stuff with the exception of a couple of um, these uh, sort of custom details, which is which was produced here at Cornell in the in the nuclear physics lab. And these guys were very kind of upset that they couldn't make it to their, like I think it was a thousand, a thousand of an inch tolerance. And I said, okay, but I think we can live with that. Um, so so here it is in Drummond's Island. Here it is now. If you happen to go upstate, it's an it's an art only until maybe the end of the year, maybe beyond that. We'll see. Uh, sorry, the end of the next academic year. Uh, but before uh, this thing happened, there are a whole bunch of other sort of let's say uh, experiments with uh, various um, sort of these round can typologies. And one of them was Gateway Bundle, which was a public project that we were commissioned to do in Lancaster. And the idea is, uh, was rather to try to create something that somehow connects to the city of Lancaster, uh, which is kind of like surrounded by these agrarian areas. And then, you know, it has these sort of strange bundles in its coat of arms. Uh, it also is, it also had to do with this kind of idea of community engagement through uh, teaching people how to use or how to kind of collect runoff uh, off the roofs. And also there was a kind of notion that this thing had to be somehow mm, kind of a attractor, a locator. Um, and also there's this idea that there's, there's, a, there's a rain garden, garden next to it. So all of a sudden this thing kind of became typologically both a cistern and a tower and also had this kind of strange arm which reminded us of that um, uh, what what uh, locomotives used to uh, do to take water in into their cooling system. Um, anyway, so there are like sort of serious drawings that were produced in order to kind of convince the Lancaster Lancaster municipalities that this is the right thing to do, including renderings like this, and then of course construction documents. This is one of the few projects that we actually didn't build ourselves, uh, but it was actually constructed. But there were serious models. Uh, what, what's interesting about it, it was kind of, again, completely, well, completely kind of unremarkable in, in, in terms of its uh, purpose, completely unappealing in terms of its materials. In fact, it kind of is part of the sort of strange infrastructure that is already on the roof. Uh, but at the same time, it sort of does these sort of strange things like uh, watering the existing uh, garden there with these kind of strange drips, dip, 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 so there's a kind of sound to this. Uh, and, um, you know, like it, it, it still is like, it, it seems like it's kind of a meeting place. People apparently meet there to, to grab a beer. Has a kind of um, an appealing appeal, I suppose. Uh, there was another project of similar nature, which we didn't get to do, but I guess that was the point. Uh, we were actually disqualified. Uh, this was um, a competition for a garbage can for New York City. And the idea was that the original New York City garbage cans were actually stamped. And I thought like, well, that's an interesting kind of idea. And then I can, came across this uh, documentary of um, uh, the German steel helm after the World War after World War II being converted into essentially a pasta cauldron. And all that was kind of interesting. Uh, and then of course there is um, Freitag and the kind of idea of uh, using uh, carpolines uh, to make bags out of them. So anyway, all that came into this idea that the city already owns a whole bunch of sheet metal, 
that essentially gets recycled or reused hopefully or sold for scraps out of these vehicles and the idea was to uh, use these kind of iconic presences and essentially stamp uh, garbage cans out of them. And of course, you know, we've never gotten to a prototyping stage and I'm sure, you know, the shape of these things would be dramatically different. But nevertheless, it seemed kind of an interesting point that the city itself would recycle its own uh, kind of its own presence on the streets. And that seemed like a, kind of an opt uh, connection, not only to kind of the way originally these things were made or the way actually the cars are made now, but also to kind of what I, I think the city should try to kind of project as, as an idea. So, and then, you know, this kind of summarizes fairly well by this quote uh, from Martin Pauli's Garbage Housing, uh, the idea of termination of one use and the termination of usefulness is not the same thing. Uh, and that's where this kind of notion of American spolia that we've been working on, I think, kind of comes, comes through. Uh, and we try to sort of visualize these in various um, sort of teaching engagements, for example, we taught uh, at LTU in Detroit with Jason and a whole bunch of other people. Uh, it was great fun. And the idea was that through these kind of uh, sort of material remnants of the city of Detroit, the students would get to uh, not only kind of understand the past of the city, but maybe even project the future of it. And it resulted in a whole bunch of these kind of really fascinating installations. Uh, out of the absolute junk that you know, one can find in Detroit. But we also created an exhibition there, which we brought some of the original projects in, uh, as well as these kind of case studies of sort of spolia projects that I've already described, like so, you know, Amphitheater and Arl kind of rendered in uh, uh, court concrete, or Casa de Crescenzi rendered in found wood and PVC pipe, or Menikov's house, which is my one of my favorites, rendered in sort of sawdust and the remnants of newspaper, which is actually what uh, it consists of apparently in its wall section. Uh, and uh, Teatro del Mondo kind of com combining um, the, the myth of creation of Venice as well as its uh, you know, scaffoldy and sort of off the shelf stuff that it was made out of. Uh, and even the, the poster itself was printed on a very much disused uh, triangular tube. Nobody sends drawings anymore, but they still make these tubes, I don't know why. So we decided to essentially print the poster on the inside of this thing uh, and send blank tubes and it took a while to convince the US post office to do that. Because they said, well, you can't send a blank tube. And we tried to convince them, well, it is the poster itself. Anyway, so it took a while. Uh, and finally, this is all kind of coming together, hopefully sooner rather than later uh, in this book, which I'm trying to kind of lay the case for this uh, American spolia and the use of unappealing and unremarkable that will hopefully not only sort of make our future a little bit more sustainable, but also help us get rid of the debris that we have in the last 200 years, but especially in, in the last 100 years. This 20th century was particularly uh, full of stuff that we know how to make, we have, but we don't know what to do with. So on that note, I guess this is it. Thank you very much. And uh, we can talk about other things or we'll go home. Thank you so much. That was great. A lot of a lot of the projects that you showed, I did not see on your website. So I'm very happy that we had you here so we could see a larger breadth of Yeah, I should really update the website. I know. <laughs> well, I guess anyone who didn't come missed out. But um, thank you so much. If anybody has questions, they can either put them in the chat if they'd like to type it or they can ask it verbally if they'd like to speak it. Now, can you hear me? Yes. Now, I just want to make a few remarks. I'm a great admirer of Alexander's work. And um, yeah, I'm actually doing a few lectures um, under the kind of umbrella title of Economy of Means. And it's, it's an amazing thing because it's probably his particular lecture now couldn't be more relevant because after the pandemic, uh, you know, the whole architectural profession is going to had to kind of rethink itself because the kind of excess that's been going on is probably going to come to an end, but we have to continue to be inventive and, you know, do unusual and extraordinary things. So I, I hope everybody in the audience really caught that message. Uh, the value, I mean, historically, Spolia, for example, 
was basically, you know, they would find fragments and, and uh, iconography from one generation and recycle it into the next because it was attractive or communicative. The problem now is we don't have, you know, religious or civic iconography. We don't have this familiar um, kind of raw material for communication. I mean, you can't just put carvings on buildings anymore and have them communicate to a very wide audience. So going into to things of our time, which are you know, critical consciousness and psychology, sociology, politics, uh, you know, and all of the things that are, are exploding in the news every day. And to try to invest buildings with some of those meanings is, is really the future because uh, right now, I mean, the generation the last 20 years we've been through it's been primarily about gee whiz computers, and then that translates into gee whiz big shapes. And uh, so you can make any shape, but that doesn't invest the thing with content. I think the, the value of uh, Alexander's lecture today is he's always thinking of content. Always, there's always a meaning for this. It's never just a, you know, a function or just a material or just a, a place. And because all of these things, context and place, situation, materials, all of them play a role, but they all have a story. They're all on a narrative thread. So I hope everybody got that because it's a very important aspect of his work. And as I say, it, 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 it's really kind of a, a profit lecture <laughs> for, for what we're going to be going through over the next maybe 20 or 30 years, I'm sure. Because uh, I've been on quite a few Zooms myself, and almost always the first discussion is how to recycle, how to restore, how to uh, make use of existing materials, uh, all of which are very economical from a, from, an economic, or from a money standpoint, but they're also become invested with a lot of meaning. And if we can see the meaning, then we get, the, we, we get some real power out of the work. Okay, that's just what I wanted to say. It was just a, a compliment to the whole lecture there. Unfortunately, I have to dash off because I, I have a Zoom lecture in China tomorrow morning, which means I have to get some sleep and then wake up at one o'clock in the morning to give a lecture. So I'm going to give a one o'clock in the morning lecture today. But anyway, I, Thank you, I really appreciate this. And, um, and uh, I hope the thing goes on. Many, many thanks for inviting me. I really, I really appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Uh, well, actually, just to kind of uh, thought about uh, meaning, uh, I, I think new new meaning can be kind of breathed into the old stuff too. Uh, I'm not sure that, like, for example, uh, you know, you you can you can sort of find things that are maybe like meaningless now, right? I mean, and that's why I, I personally I'm a big fan of Casa de Crescenzi because I'm not sure that the people who built it in the 11th century kind of really understood what they were. I mean, they kind of maybe, okay, they understood that, okay, this is a column, this is a piece of uh, dural lintel, even though sometimes they use sideways. But I'm not sure that they fully sort of grasped the actual iconography. They, they essentially kind of made their own out of it. So, you know, hopefully we can maybe start to invent our own stuff too. Okay. Okay. Bye -bye. Well, it's good to see all the familiar faces. Faces. Oh wait, am I supposed to read the uh, the questions? Well, someone just uh, typed one in, so I, I can read it aloud. Okay. I guess you can respond. Unless uh, Linda, would you like to speak it? Sure. I came on late, so I missed some of the beginning, but I was fascinated by the um, archival digs of. Histor history that has happened that we are unaware of, and then how the response to that, you know, actually informed some of your work. So I was just thanking you for letting me in late and um, realizing how we always have to relearn what has been learned before and look anew at what has happened before. So um, I liked all the work I saw that came after it and how it's moving around and um, activating different sites for people to think differently about what happened earlier. So thank you. 
Well, th thank you. Although I gotta say, um, kind of digging up various sort of pieces of history is not always such an innocent thing, uh, especially when, like, for example, I mean, I kind of went into, you know, the specific crossing the line thing, and I see some people who actually helped me here uh, with it uh, on, on the Zoom too. Um, um, I, I, was, I was not necessarily prepared. I mean, I didn't have the background, uh, and, you know, these kind of installation projects, they have a tendency to move so fairly quickly, so there is a certain sort of sense of rush, but at the same time, the, the, the Native American community, I think their sense of history is very different, meaning that like this stuff to us happened 250 years ago, to them it happened essentially yesterday. There's a very much a continuity. Uh, so again, like I said, that was, that was a really difficult one. Uh, so, you know, it's not always kind of such an, sort of an innocent thing. Uh, to kind of dig up the, the old things. But at the same time, I think it was an important thing, like for me anyway, to kind of learn all this stuff was um, extremely eye-opening. And I think it was for some other people too, so. I think it's really important you shared it with us as well. As architects, we investigate and we try to dig deeply into site and the archeology span of site, but now we know that there are additional strains that we have to reveal, that we have to uncover and reveal. And the fact that you did this in some of these things was, I thought, really remarkable. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I, I can jump in. Um, I really, I really enjoyed the like the journey of your presentation, and um, I think there's like a certain humbleness to like looking at what's around you, uh, and I'm interested on your on your thoughts on like how this, like as a practice, can transcend like what is already there, or like the, you know, even like the potentially like problematic frameworks or um, just existing conditions, and um, yeah, I mean, because on one hand, it, like it almost seems like it, it almost runs the risk too of like being um, like almost overly constrained. But I, I you know, it, it felt like there's like something more that you're like looking for. And so I just, I'm just curious like what your thoughts are on that. Right. Well, I, I, again, I, I, I realized at some point the constraints are actually a good thing. I mean, I spent maybe the first 10 years of my, let's say like sort of practicing my, my 20s uh, uh, working on things that were often unconstrained in terms of budget, in terms of sort of ambition in terms of uh, even kind of, uh, I don't know, uh, sort of connection to, to groundedness to the world. Uh, you know, like projects that had like absolutely, you know, like unlimited budgets. And that was kind of difficult to deal with, I gotta say. Uh, I mean, I, I came out of that thinking like, okay, I need to, change direction dramatically because I, I cannot really do this sort of stuff any longer. I mean, more, not so much so, I mean, uh, to some degree on kind of moral ground too, that there's like, you know, the not even, you know, 1%, it was like point, you know, point zero zero one percent uh, But also just because again, like once when nothing is limiting you, you can do anything, you can also do kind of nothing. So in a way, I think a limit is a good thing. And that's why actually, uh, the project that I showed in Iceland, we showed up with some kind of preconceived idea that we're going to do, I don't even remember what, and we kind of got there, and I'm like, wait a minute, there's there's this horizon, that's all there is, so let's do something about this horizon, because it's the only thing that's kind of contextually present, so I guess I'm a, I guess I'm a big fan of context, uh, content rather, and context, because it sort of at least helps you uh, sort of start something, because otherwise, I, at least for me, it's very difficult to sort of dig in. I mean, otherwise you just end up sort of producing, I guess, cliches, at least me, like, or stuff that I've sort of done before. Uh, I mean, the same thing with, with the, the Surreal Art Project. I mean, I remember we doodled something that was like completely different uh, and we sort of got it out of our systems. And then, I don't know, it was a rainy day and we sort of remembered Sandy and we started looking at like the flood and anyway. So all of a sudden the narrative started to happen. So I guess I'm, I'm, I think it's a good thing. Yeah, there's a question in the chat. Um, Esther Ishamwe asks, the rethinking and repurposing of existing, existing spaces is an 
and learning process of what we have been taught. What practices do you encourage architecture students to apply so as to employ that new mindset? Ah, it's a good question. I mean, I can theoretically give a whole like other lecture on, on kind of teaching this stuff. Um, but well, I mean, I mean, it, it sort of depends on, on, on the, depends on the um, sort of level. Uh, but I would say, and again, I see some people who sort of gone through it. Uh, when the first year, the idea of kind of un, unlearning what you already know, like the, the, the idea that the house is sort of this thing with the little chimney and the thing, uh, or even kind of like taking something and say, oh, I know what it is because I've seen it before. The kind of um, essentially the ability to like turn off your head in a way, uh, turn off your kind of recognition software, but but turn on your tactility, turn on your associative um, sort of brain. Like I mean, that's the that's the thing uh, that I think is important to learn, and also equally important. And this is where I think this is where kind of suffering in the pandemic there. Uh, is the ability to uh, work with material because they're kind of certain again tactility and also kind of memory and also appreciation for what you can and cannot do to a certain thing. Uh, I think very much translates into like kind of your understanding of how far and what kind of limits you can push. I have a question going back a little bit to the idea of the constraints. Um, a lot, a lot of what we were dealing with was twofold um, in regards to materiality. The first one was using material that's already common, but now like the, the siding for a house, uh, et cetera. And then the, the second half that I noticed was uh, the, the actual reuse of material that has been used before, the collection of colonial wood that's put, made together into a surface that's carved out of. Um, and I was wondering as a, as a project of reuse, as not just uh, not just a provocative measure, but uh, an actual cultural project of of spolia or of the reuse of buildings that are no longer being used or being torn down materiality in that way. How do the constraints of the actual construction in industry hold back the larger or a larger movement towards the reuse of materials? Well, yeah, of course. I mean, I, I think I showed one of their first slides was a demolition of uh, College Town Bagels, which is, I know, those of you who have ever been to Ithaca know. Uh, it's, you know, it's like a hundred year old building and it basically just bulldozed the thing because it's the easiest thing to do. Uh, and then for like a couple of days, this kind of pile of debris was just sort of sitting there. Um, so, and I mean, that's the same, the same happened to, I don't know, the, the, the Christ to say the cathedral when they were trying to build the palace of the Soviet, they just blew this thing up. So it's it's always, um, it's a lot easier to, in the kind of present context, to sort of send heavy machinery in and then worry about it later. Uh, so in this sense, we're kind of in a disadvantage. Even like the, the, the very same vinyl siding, uh, it's actually not that difficult to take it down. Uh, and they can last forever too, but because it's so cheap, it's actually kind of easier to just bulldoze the damn thing. So the construction industry, yeah, I mean, the construction industry is very much, I would say, complicit in it. But at the same, I don't know, it's like sort of difficult to blame these people too, because they're like, you know, budgets, issues, skills, all these sort of things, right? So uh, it's, 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 it's sort of a tough thing. I mean, when there was a building, uh, when the library was being constructed here, I was trying to save uh, railings from the old, from the old Rand Hall, and they were promised to me, but because the demolition went so quickly, I couldn't even, like, sort of, they couldn't even save those things. I mean, this, like, sort of speed of, of, of disappearing things is kind of fascinating. So I don't know how to kind of counter this stuff on that level, other than, uh, making an argument that the stuff can be used in a different way other than making the argument that the stuff otherwise goes into a landfill for 10,000 years and just kind of sits there or other than which will happen soon which is going to run out of stuff and then we have no choice so you know it's it's a kind of that's basically the the biggest frustration with this, with this situation or form i guess your own kind of demolition crew 
like for example, you know, Rotor in, 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 in Belgium is a kind of an example. I mean, these guys go in, they take stuff down that they can, and then they sell it. And, you know, so, yeah. So we need, we need more of those Rotors. Thank you, Alex. Really thoroughly enjoyed it and always followed your work, but um, Thanks, sir. really great to see all the different things coming together. I'm curious, you, you don't use the word degrowth uh, when you talk about your projects, but degrowth is very, very much, it's, in my opinion, it's literally what you're doing and it's uh, uh, embedded in it is, of course, a critique of uh, normative production of capital and all of that. Um, but I wonder about um, degrowth because um, it's also a question of not just uh, the putting stuff together from, from the remains of, of things, but also it's about a whole other way of living. Uh, it's about a certain kind of proximity to resources. It's about the way in which, I don't know, the HVAC system of something is put together. Um, so I was curious about your your thoughts on uh, buildings that that actually use you know there's the there's the embodied energy of something but then there's also the use uh, energy that is when something is being used so uh, I was curious about like how do you think of resources uh, be uh, of just maintenance and use. Uh, and and persistence because I guess there's like several cycles uh, of of uh, putting stuff together, right. repurposing it, but also of just sustenance. Right. Well, I yeah, good question. I'm I can't say that I'm sort of go. I would go deeply into this. I mean, that seems to be at least now the kind of the sort of strange purview of the engineers. Uh, which is shouldn't really be the which case. The problem, exactly. I know, uh, but also I, I gotta say I'm I'm a little bit um, how should I put it averse to the kind of buzzwords. Uh, was at some point, but like, ten years ago, we sort of decided to talk about slow things, realizing quickly that maybe it wasn't such a brilliant idea because all of a sudden there was this kind of cool thing and everybody was sort of slow, <laughs> even though you know that wasn't the case. So that's why, like, that's why I didn't talk about labor practices, even though I think it's a very important thing. That's why I didn't necessarily talk about degrowth. I mean, I, I sort of, I'm a little bit like a buzzword sort of neutral. But, uh, but that said, um, well, having done kind of a couple of like sort of, you know, real buildings, uh, I realized that I think I mean, and again, within a certain scale, let's like, I mean, I haven't, you know, it's been a while since I kind of, I was, I was involved in like something big, like, uh, like a huge museum or something like that. But on a kind of one-to-one -one sort of residential level, I think we're really overcomplicating things. I mean, if, if you can open a window on one side and a window on the other side, and you have, you know, and the wind is going the right way, and then you have, uh, you know, sort of shading from the sun in the, in the summertime, you can actually have air conditioning. You know, it's, it's like sort of that stupid. Uh, if you site your uh, sort of building in such a way to kind of catch sort of daylight and, you know, be resistant to like, I don't know, particularly nasty winds, you can actually have fairly warm uh, house without going crazy on extensive uh, mechanical equipment. I mean, mechanic, I don't know, like air conditioning was invented in Syracuse, as you know, I'm sure, uh, like in the 30s. And I'm sort of just like, the devil showed up to Syracuse in a way uh, and sort of ruined 20th century architecture, right? Because all of a sudden you could have a glass skyscraper in Phoenix. Uh, so anyway, like I said, I'm, I, I mean, you sort of open a little bit of a can of worms because I, 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 I can't say I, I'm, not, I'm not like a Luddite by any means, but at the same time, I'm a little suspicious of sort of buzzwords and also this kind of engineering side of things when it comes to uh, sort of building maintenance. And if you, if you, if you detail things well, simply and the thing sheds water and it doesn't let in too much cold air you'll be fine right thank you yeah thanks for coming thanks alex for a really great lecture um you know i think uh 
for those of us who went to Cornell, we kind of grew up in these lessons, but it's really nice to hear you present them. And I'm a bit curious about um, maybe how you would describe like the development of narrative in your work. Um, because I think it's something that, that uh, came about or seemed um, naturally part of architecture for me having studied with you or, or studied at Cornell, but I don't think that it is necessarily part of the kind of tradition of Cornell's pedagogy. So I'm curious if you could talk about like where that emerges in your work, Cornell, Princeton in practice, um, or like where, where you think that you kind of trace that, that uh, narrative and, and pedagogy. Right. Uh, yeah, well, thank you, Katie. Uh, good question. Uh, I mean, Cornell is somewhat complicit in this, I would say. At least there was a moment in time in the 80s when all there was was stories. Uh, there was a moment in time in Princeton when all they did was write about buildings rather than design them. Uh, so I guess maybe I just kind of hit them at the, the, all, all the right times. But at the same time, I, I know I was always interested in history. There was something, there was something kind of weirdly, um, um, I don't know, cozy in the past for me, or at least there, there was. I mean, now I understand that it could be really scary stuff that still can bite you. But somehow back in the day, and it started with like really stupid things like old toy soldiers, or you, you know, you started reading about this. Anyway, so there was some kind of a strange fascination with things that happened in the past, um, maybe because the contemporary stuff was sort of, let's say, unappealing, you know. Uh, but again, that's just sort of for me. But then I also realized, uh, having sort of done some traveling kind of early on in my life to like places like St. Petersburg, uh, basically, architecture was the manifestation of those histories, right? So when you see these buildings and you know that they were like, oh, they were built, I know, like whatever, you see the Hermitage, built in the whatever mid uh, 1700s like oh this is actually sort of still standing you can touch this thing so anyway so this kind of idea of like reading a book and then about something and actually kind of seeing the the, the evidence of it and embodied in whatever stone plaster wood even for that matter i mean what the really fascinating time was i uh, seeing state churches in norway that was you know standing there since 12th century i mean still Right, so this kind of the, the sort of longevity embodied in, in something that we do as architects. Uh, I, I just said it, we, we do, uh, as architects, I, I can't believe I did it. Anyway, so the stuff that we do uh, can potentially be essentially kind of uh, this kind of historical marker for, for the next generation. So that's kind of a fascinating thing for me. So in a way, I think the narrative sort of comes naturally. But again, I think it also has something to do with the kind of legacies of the institutions that I hit at the kind of the, the right time at the right place or the wrong time in the wrong place, however you want to see it. But yeah, I mean, the narrative, I, you're right. It's, it's kind of an important thing for me because otherwise, otherwise I'm not sure what, what can drive it. I mean, I suppose form can drive it. I suppose material can drive it, but I think there's gotta be some kind of a story there uh, to sort of suggest not only kind of, well, basically suggest the passage of time. Let's put it this way. Thanks, Alex. Thank you. I can read that. Your thoughts on how spol spolia come into the digital in light of the current environmental climate and the access to the external and now the digital has come to interface our access to the environment. Well, well, what do you mean the digital? I mean, it's like the, the, the funny thing about the digital, it's, it's an adjective, right? Uh, but digital what? Like, I mean, if we're talking about kind of tools of, of, of the trade, I'm not sure, you know, like that has anything necessarily uh, like sort of good or bad to add. I mean, it, it, is, it is sort of what it is. I mean, if you're talking about some kind of, um, I don't know. Like, I mean, if we're talking about some kind of like systems way of making, we're talking about like kind of robotic construction. Uh, I don't know yet. I mean, I haven't like, it, it, because basically every time I see a robot in, in the works, like for example, I know I, I saw that um, bricklaying robot, right? Uh, which is pretty cool, right? The thing kind of does its thing. Uh, but also behind it, there is a guy shoveling the, the, the mortar into the thing by hand. So, you know, like, I don't think we're entirely sort of fully in the proverbial digital, so it's a little difficult to say. But at the same time, I'm really interested in the idea of, um, 
kind of technology that is obsolete uh, and these things sort of happen fairly quickly, uh, how it can be kind of used or reused uh, again. And I, you know, I did several projects. I mean, I didn't share, for example, the, the nano uh, exhibit, which came in contact with a lot of this uh, sort of old technology and the kind of new world. Uh, so anyway, so there, there's definitely, I think there's potential to it. I just, um, I don't think we're sort of entirely there yet. I mean, you know, it's a little, a little difficult to, to judge. Maybe the next generation can fully figure it out. Although maybe, maybe digital can, can mean something else in terms of expanding access um, and therefore like a certain sense of loss of meaning. We see pictures of anything, anywhere, any building in any place, and then suddenly that becomes the picture on the phone and no longer the materiality of the building or the experience of being in it. And in that way, I think it ties, it ties together with the, with the fact that, let's say, a neighborhood doesn't care that a bulldozer rolls in and knocks down a building because that building doesn't mean that much to the place, possibly, if, if, if everything's global and if, if nothing is really contained and everything's ever expanding um, in a way that, that can, I guess that's not digital in its... Well, no, no, you're right, you're right. It is digital. And actually, uh, um, I remember fairly recently, uh, well, I mean, as a part of this whole pandemic situation, um, uh, uh, Paul Antonelli and... Um, uh, Paul Antonelli and... Well, anyway, Paul Antonelli and a friend of his, uh, Alice Rosthorn, uh, started this uh, Design Emergency podcast, which I... You guys should check it out. It's actually pretty cool. Uh, it's it's a kind of uh, essentially kind of a gathering of people who are um, like somehow kind of on the cusp of like trying to make a difference in this like weird situation. Uh, like like mass and like anyway. So they had a conversation with um, S. Devlin, who is a stage designer uh, in London. Uh, and you know she like recently, well, lately, you know, has been doing this sort of massive uh, sort of global gatherings, right? I mean, they're kind of digitally connected. Anyway, so there's like the kind of so the question is, in the theater world, right, which is really susceptible to the pandemic, like what's the next sort of deal, right? Is it is it? Uh, and that was a question. Is it like are we kind of going fully uh, sort of digitally in 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 the theatrical sort of experience? And she basically said, you know, I, I spent whatever it's like 30 years doing, uh, making sure the theater is a very sort of personal experience. I kind of resist to this idea. Uh, but at the same time, I can see the di digital situation be able to connect a kind of a small local community to another small local community to yet another small local community to kind of sort of much more sort of global uh, experience, which, you know, I don't think it's such a bad thing and like for example if one little small community all of a sudden bulldozes a building and another small community sees it that could actually be you know like a very quick way to kind of condemn this like for example you know again let's say i don't know the you know for the palace of the soviet right they blew up the cathedral uh if if there was an instagram feed on this thing in 1931 I imagine the demolition would have been uh, either very differently done or not done at all. So anyway, I think like it's a kind of a double sort of edged situation. Yeah, in, in a way, in a way that situation, well, on, on the one hand, it, it values, maybe there would be resistance to the, to the destruction of it. In a way, there's only resistance to it because it's transformation into an iconography that can be shared quickly. While the apartment building around the corner from you, instead of having its base, um, meaning to the people that live around it is suddenly reduced to zero because it's a zero one game between something that has meaning and can be shared as well as... true it dep depends on how famous that the apartment building became uh you know because of look well, like, yeah, yeah well not everything that's evil is completely evil right and not everything that's good is completely good that's that is sadly true yeah in fact if anything is completely good it sounds scary. Yeah. <laughs> Something's hiding somewhere, right? Right. All right. Well, I guess on that note, I don't know. Are you guys, have, uh, should, we, should we call it or is there something? Yeah. If, if anybody has any last questions, feel free to ask. If not, then I'd like to thank everybody for coming to the student lecture series.
this is the last one this semester, but we'll be continuing next semester and every semester that follows. Uh, so join us then as well. Uh, thank you for joining us, Alexander, and thank you everybody for coming. Have a good night. My pleasure is entirely mine. Thanks a lot, and it's great to see all these wonderful faces. Have a great night, everyone. Enjoy the weekend. Yep, you too.